And uh, Dr. Lee Willis is a sociologist. And I used him for a, uh, uh, what I wanted to be considered as a written conversation for an article I wrote for Iona Magazine back in 2007. So 15 years of knowing that man. Uh, and he's a fantastic resource. And uh, I'll let him get into more of the story. But he was just going home and uh, in his hometown in, in Ohio. And if the story is correct, uh, he went and discovered that a lot of people who were his contemporaries and younger were dying or killing themselves and made him do some research as to what was going on in that town. And the research of that story uh, uh, made way to me and I extrapolated it further into the second about black men today. Now that was a generation ago. So imagine how the conversation has progressed, or should I say digressed on this topic when it comes to the state of black men and what's going on. So he's gonna rap with us right now. He's getting his uncle nearest. I got myself uh, a hazy IPA, which you can see because now my screen isn't scrambled like last week. <laughs> and Ty got him some little something. Uh, the other thing about Lee Willis, before we get into uh, his accolades, he can talk about himself. He's a big comic book guy. Ain't that right, Lee? Indeed, indeed. We, we have to bring you back so we can talk about all this Marvel stuff. I don't like the current phase, but I think I think it's been spotty. I thought Spider-Man was excellent, though. And uh, I'll get your opinion. Yeah, these, these, these phase four movies, you know, who knows what's going to happen. But remember, four years ago today, Black Panther hit theaters. So yes. represent for a second. That's right. Black Panthers hit theater. I saw it at midnight. Uh, I didn't even tell the woman I was dating. And uh, I'm going to pour out a little bit for King T'Challa. And I'm going to drink the rest of it. Cheers, Word. gents. Let's Word. have a conversation. Cheers. All right. Dr. Lee Willis, tell us about your background. And... Um, and we'll get into the conversation. Sure. Um, I am a medical sociologist by training. Um, I have a PhD in medical sociology, as you know, you would guess. I also have a master's in public health um, in intervention development, um, health communication, and um, evaluation. So those are my, my big um, areas. I also focus on mental health. Um, I just fancy myself as just a general public health practitioner, primarily, but I uh, was really interested in, in mental health, um, interested in men's issues, in mental health in general, uh, fathering, like all those sorts of things, because, you know, I feel like there's a lot of other people who advocate for themselves, but there aren't, you know, brothers, we don't necessarily have the advocates, or and sometimes we don't advocate for our own selves, so that that was something that I wanted to change, and that's kind of why I got into um, the health field. So we, we have a question here, and uh, Ty, if you could like also watch the the comments and, and bring up the question. It. You saw it. the big question it, yeah. from Honey Fun underscore is what I the fuck is sociology? I, it sounds like you're trying to be funny, so you're not going to add to the conversation. But if you if, if you feel the need to extrapolate on that. Dr. Willis, please do so real quick. What is mental sociology? Yes, sir. Um, it's the study of the social causes and consequences of health and illness. So basically, how does society kill you in a lot of different ways? Um, be it, you know, stress, uh, be it maternal and child health, be it um, institutionalized racism, um, environmental racism, um, be it medical training and education, um, all those different sorts of things. Also looking at, you know, health, um, health behaviors, why people, you know, cook, eat, exercise, don't exercise, all those sorts of things. Um, those are some of the realms, you know, kind of like a quick and dirty answer of what um, medical sociology is. So it's the application of, you know, sociological principles to health and illness. How does society kill you? Is the pithy statement there? Uh, you 
lost Ty, but you're still there. So, uh, if Ty, when you get your connection, please come back on. Uh, now, Ty, uh, Dr. Willis, Ty is a soldier mm-hmm. who uh, fought for our country. He's out of the Army. He's been in the Army for 25 years, went to Afghanistan, suffers from PTSD. Your studies, your studies have found that PTSD is occurring for men right now, black men in America, domestically, domestic PTSD. Can you talk about that with your studies a little bit? Absolutely. Um, you know, just as, as you were saying, like your partner, you know, experienced things, you know, being at war and, and, and you know, experiencing violence and traumatic events. Um, we, as African-American men in this country, depending on the environment that you grow up in, you may experience some of those, those same, you know, things. You know, I have friends who have, you know, lived in, you know, areas where high homicide, high suicide, just a lot of like violence um, and have have perpetrated, seen, you know, done some of those things. And, you know, as a result of that, there's a lot of, you know, PTSD, like what has happened to me? How did I survive? How do I cope? How do I manage? Like those sorts of things. And it turns into a lot of maladaptive behaviors, such as, you know, drinking, um, you know, a lot of drugs use, um, just inability to form, you know, um, tight relationships with people. Um, and part of it, you know, one of the bigger things that I have found, and I've learned this, you know, just in experiencing just general, um, just life events and things I've gone through in the past, you know, few years is that a lot, unfortunately, a lot of black men, we still don't want to talk about some of the things that we may feel and the things that we may experience. And, and that's a that's a huge thing. We think that we can do it all by ourselves and we don't want to talk about it, you know, either with a professional, let alone like our friends. Like, so I really want to commend y'all for having this dialogue, this real honest and open dialogue about um, men's mental health issues. Because I think that it's a it's a huge thing. I mean, if you look at it now, I, I know like Sean, you talked about the auspices under which, you know, you and I met in thinking about, um, you know, African-American uh, male suicide, you know, rate, suicide and homicide, you know, have been uh, really high in our community, especially um, dealing with the pandemic. We've seen that start to increase um, more, more and more uh, over these last, you know, two, two years or so. Uh, am I correct? Uh, when we did that story a generation ago, 15 years ago, mm-hmm. uh, uh, suicide amongst like a younger black demographic, I don't have numbers in front of me because I've been running around all day. And like I said, I had to wait to go to basically. It's, it's, it was like the sec- it's like the second or third leading cause of death amongst young yeah. black men. Yeah, yeah. That yeah, is astounding. Yeah. Suicide, the second leading cause of death amongst young black men. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's been that way for quite some time. And there are some people that have argued that um, the homicide, the high homicide rate are maybe reflective of attenuated suicides, where there's such a stigma around committing suicide in the black community such that um, an individual will put themselves in a situation where they'll provoke something where there will be um, a lethal retaliation, knowing that there will be lethal retaliation. So it's almost like an attenuated suicide, as they call it. So it's, it's a death wish. A it's like, yeah, so, exactly. It's a death wish. Exactly. Precisely. That's precisely and, it. And so the, this has been exacerbated by the pandemic. And uh, I'm going to let you get in here, Ty, and ask a couple of questions. But I want to I want to put a, uh, a stamp on this thing. The way we met and the, 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 the issue that I discovered upon doing the story that I was doing about black men and black women with you, you had a study that you did when you went to your hometown in Ohio. Right. By the way, are you a Bengals fan? Or are you a Browns fan? Neither. I'm a Steelers fan. You're one of them. Oh, I am. Okay. I am. I am. I'm but you like very the Buckeyes, proud right? Steelers fan. Oh yeah. Yeah. You didn't give yeah. A shit when Cincinnati lost the way they did. I mean, uh, I was happy, you know, that Cincinnati made it because they make it, but they don't ever win exactly. usually. But you know, still. Uh, you well, know, right. I didn't have a 
dog in the fight. I didn't. All right, copy that. Well, okay, so I want you to talk about this study when you went to your hometown and what you discovered amongst the black men of your hometown, if that's if that's correct. Do you remember that? Uh, it was like a study oh, well, of yes. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't necessarily um, do a study in my hometown per se, but just that there were a few situations um, in the area and a few um, people that that I knew directly, or I was one degree separated from, um, where there were these events where these folk had, you know, these these brothers had taken their lives, and they were of a variety of different ages. Um, you know, some old some young, you know, contemporaries, you know, things like that. Um, but what what we began to see um, just in this small, you know, kind of area in my small circle, um, and, and, and I will say this too, my father, um, I'm a second generation social scientist. My dad was a cultural anthropologist. And, you know, he said, like, there's, there's something going on, you know, right now in an area and in, in our, you know, in, in our social circle that we're seeing this start to happen and then lo and behold um, I was able to um, find some information and get some data for the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention that was bearing this out that they were seeing a rise in um, African American suicide particularly among African American men um, at the time so that that's kind of how I got into this you know era of, of, of doing this this research um, um, and then from there, I decided that I was going to actually dedicate, you know, my graduate school career into doing this research. And that was the focus of my um, of my doctoral uh, research. And I published a couple papers and I think that's how you found me. And, you know, the rest, as they say, is 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 history. Um, but but I still am very, you know, passionate about, you know, um, African-American men's mental health. Um, since we have talked, there have been, you know, more. Um, people who have started to focus on that issue and there are actually um some interventions um, that have been developed uh, by like the National Institutes of Health that focus primarily on, you know, men of color mm -hmm. um, dealing with issues of depression and PTSD and, you know, giving people coping resources and, you know, things like that. And just even personally in my life, just trying to convene, you know, different groups of guys just to be able to talk, um, you know, about whatever it is that you're going through. There's no judgment you know, we're just going to come together and talk and just try to help each other. Uh, we definitely got to talk more um, and getting men to open up about these things. The vulnerability piece, as women like to say, is uh, important. Ty, I'm going to let you have the calm. What you got? Wow. Um, I don't even really know where to start. Uh, where do you think I should start? I think it's a lot. Should, how about it is a lot, and it's a lot to unpack, but we do have time. Mm -hmm. How about you go into your what you feel when people hear someone has PTSD, I know you spoke about this in different places, could you at least explain how you feel and if we have men who feel like you on a domestic piece, that's a good place to start and then I'll let Dr. Willis uh, volley that with you. Cool. Sure thing. Well, you know, my approach to the PTSD and anxiety has always been different. The way I feel is just, you know, things have affected me in the past that make me who I am today. So my approach to that is that that's not necessarily a bad thing unless I'm not acknowledging that or I have no control of that or I'm using those things to do malicious acts, right? If you're still a you know good person doing the right thing, treating everyone right, then it's just PTSD, right? You can have PTSD because there are things that have occurred that you had no control over, and that's just what it is. You're just finding your way uh, to move on from that. Um, yeah, that, that's what it is to me. Do you know your triggers, Ty? Yeah, I do. Do you? Do you uh, it's essentially things that I can't control. But, loud, I, loud, I, loud, but I know that. Gunshots like no, 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 no. It's, not, well, it's not even that. So it's not even that. Um, so what? Uh, the 4th of July, I probably wouldn't go far on 4th of July because I know how that's going to make me feel. But I know that it's 4th of July, so I'm not, you know, I'm aware that it's 4th of July. 
being in the passenger seat when someone else is driving. I don't, I don't like that. I don't like crowds. I don't like my back to the door. I don't like things that I can't control. Like if I'm out with my daughter and it's too many people around us, I don't like that. It doesn't mean that I can't handle it. It just means that I'm aware and it's going to probably bring some stress to me. Got it. So you're more like hyper vigilant in those sort of situations. Yeah, I'm very intuitive. I always need to know what's going on around me. But it's to a point to where I can see people with their hands in their pockets. I can see people fidgeting. I can see people playing with their hair, people humming to themselves. Like I see everything and I'm constantly analyzing it all because I've had this fight or flight mechanism for a very long time. And it's hard to get rid of that. Now, Dr. Willis, this sound, these sound like positive things when you acknowledge that you have issues, right? So, mm -hmm. but are you finding or have you found that the, the issue now with black men is that the reason we have the suicide rates and the homicide rates is that black men are just acting out instead of channeling that energy towards solutions? How can you juxtapose what I just said there to what yeah, Ty is yeah, doing I and, think, and what you find? Yeah, I think it's great because Ty is, is, is very aware of, you know, what, what what he, he is experiencing and he knows what his triggers are. Whereas I think that some folks don't necessarily know what their triggers are and they could just, you know, go off. Not only do they not know, well, if you don't know, then maybe the people around you and your loved ones don't know either. So they could inadvertently, you know, do something that may actually mm -hmm. trigger you or put you in a situation where you will be triggered if you don't you know necessarily no so i think that that's a that's a very um i think that that's a very important thing um to consider so acknowledging or, or knowing that you may have um things that you need to deal with and things to unpack and that you know it might be a situation where it might not ever go away but it's something that you can live with and manage um and then educating those people you know around you because like I, I have friends who have PTSD and they will tell me like these are my triggers you know and I'm like okay like I know that like when I'm with you I will be aware of that um, I will try to do my best to make sure that I don't put you in situations or that I don't do anything that I know that's going to make you uncomfortable and it's not to the point where I think that they would you know act out or do anything but I just want them to feel um, comfortable so it's about you know compassion and understanding of the of the people around you as well to help you kind of get through through things hmm. so when it comes to yeah so ty uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna ask this question and i'm gonna get back to you so when it comes to brothers in america domestically mm -hmm. who have ptsd is it still a matter of they have to come to know that they have ptsd um well, yeah, go, you go you go ty go ahead there's a lot to that so the first thing is, is that PTSD is not just people who've gone to war. Like there's kids that's right. in America that's suffering from PTSD and that's are right. getting zero support. That's right. Zero. Just, just all around. So you're saying not just racially, but yes. just people who have issues. Yes. With everything that is going on, people's microaggressions, the way that things are promoted on TV, like you can get PTSD just from being black and having to think about being black almost everywhere you go right i mean not not to interrupt you but just yeah. looking at the events of the last you know two years with you know george floyd and everything mm -hmm. else just watching the news was mm -hmm. stressful and if someone tells you that that was not stressful i don't i wouldn't believe you you know what yes. i mean yes so what i'm thinking is we're not normalizing normal. Um, I'm going to try my best to explain it. It just seems like with black men, success is a high risk, high reward type thing. Meaning we're not promoting everything that's in between. We're either promoting that you're broke mm -hmm. or we're promoting that you're highly successful. Mm -hmm. When they're not seeing success as someone that can be an engineer or a doctor or a lawyer, because we're not normalizing that. 
so what I try to do is I try to normalize everyday success. Like there was a tweet that said um, they were asking about people's friends who were making six figures and people were dumbfounded that that exists. But then I was like, I can't think of any of my guy friends who don't. Do you know what I mean? But people seem to take that as like this extravagant, magnificent thing to the point where they believe that that's an unattainable goal. Mm -hmm. We need to treat it like it is, like it's normal. I've seen people online, they pass uh, uh, an exam for a certification and they act like that's the best thing that could have ever happened to them. And they act like, you know, Things are, things are amazing and I'm just trying to tell them like you work for that that should be a normal thing the fact that you can attain something that you've worked for uh, Sherry says and I want, mm-hmm. want you to attest to this uh, both you but I'll throw it to Dr. Willis mm-hmm. and then to you Ty she mm-hmm. says one of the problems is that there's a great distrust of medical providers by black communities historically they used our bodies as science experiments so what, what's being said is that the the generic distrust on a historic level of black people to go to these same folks who could help you uh-huh. um, has prevented you from doing things like from get a vaccine to get your minds checked out and get right. Yeah. Yeah. Do you agree? Both of you agree to that? Can you, can you speak on that too, Lee? Oh, yeah. I mean, absolutely. I mean, there's been a lot that's been done in terms of um, the, the knowledge base of medicine in this country and around the world has been done on, you know, people of color's black or, or people of color's backs. And in this country in particular on um, on black people. So, so yeah, so there is a very healthy um, distrust of, of medicine. And then you couple that with um, some of the experiences when you're going to see people who don't look like you, don't understand you and don't treat you the best. I mean, that can be a very um, difficult thing to navigate. Hence, you get, you, you know, situations where people don't want to um, see providers. So I think that um, there needs to be some degree of, and, and I think this is beginning to happen now, is that there's there's a lot more cultural sensitivity training that, that is going on in um, in medical programs now, I think. Um, now, whether or not people use it when they get out, that's a whole nother matter, but I think that at least a token attempt is being made like for that. And I'm not saying that people shouldn't be, that there shouldn't be a healthy dose of, you know, um, of skepticism. But at the end of the day, if you need help, you need to go where you need to go to actually get it. So it's about finding a provider that you feel like you can trust and that you you will um, feel comfortable trusting your mind and your body too. So there are plenty of, you know, African-American um, physicians, African-American nurses, like African-American therapists. And I'll say it, I, I have seen, I am currently seeing a therapist myself, like I am. I mean, and, I'm totally, and, and no, I have normalizing, no that. Yeah, normalizing yeah. the seeing of this therapist. Yeah, uh, yeah. T- I'll throw it back to I'll throw it to Ty real quick because I know we're short on your time. Although I'm going to ask you, uh, Doc Law, can you give me five extra minutes? Can you extend until yeah, nine, yeah, no nine ten? Uh, no problem, so no problem. we have still nine ten. I'm going to do uh, my radio summation here. Uh, we're at the top of the hour here, top of the hour, and we're with Dr. Lee Willis, uh, a medical sociologist. Uh, social scientist, all around guru. He's like a mental black mental Dr. Fauci here, talking about <laughs> talking about black male mental issues and PTSD amongst us. We also have Ty Wilson as my wingman, as you know him to see him, and uh, he's also a, a I won't say a sufferer of PTSD, but he's managing it. And I'm going to throw this question to Ty and then let Ty moderate for a second. Yeah. Uh, Ty, are you also are you talking to people? Are you talking to someone on a therapeutic level? Uh, or, or, and what do you think it takes for men, particularly black men, people of our hue, to start opening up about certain things? You got it. Yeah. The first question, no, but I am looking for someone. Um, the second question is we mentioned trust, and the trust is huge. And finding someone that you trust that can also be influential is huge. We talk normalizing it. Um, what I was going to say is we don't. 
talk about going to the doctors enough and taking care of yourself on a physical level. And I chuckled earlier because for like four or five months when I had the cough from anxiety, my mom was telling me, Ty, like, you need to go see someone. And I was like, it'll go away, it'll go away, it'll go away. Mm -hmm. And what's funny is, is because I subconsciously live with that distrust to a point to where I make jokes about it. When people are like, why are you colorblind? How, you know, I don't understand that. I always joke and say the Tuskegee experiment. Mm -hmm. Right? It probably came down to me from the Tuskegee experiment. So subconsciously, I'm still living it. I'm still living with that distrust. We were just talking about the police the other night where you were completely innocent, but for some reason, you kind of cringe up a little bit. And I yeah. feel like we need to normalize it being okay by influential people. I always say things like, if Jay-Z can get millions of people to get dirt off their shoulder, he can get millions of people to not cheat on their wives. He can get millions of people to go get checked up. <laughs> right? Yeah. But that's not where it's at. You know? Or, so, <laughs> or just to go back to what y'all were talking about, y'all were talking uh, about Kanye. I mean, it's mm -hmm. clear Kanye is suffering from, you know, Something, he's, yeah. he's, he's at least bipolar. And this is just my armchair, you know, <laughs> diagnosis. Well, the word is that he's at least off his meds in, a, in the bad way. Like, not in like, I'm going to wean myself off. He's He's off his meds and just saying. Oh, yeah. yeah. No, he said that he wasn't going to take them because he didn't like how they made him feel. You know, I saw that in the interview. Um, and I think that, like, if someone like that were to say, okay, yes, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm bipolar, I'm whatever, but I'm taking my meds, I'm seeing a therapist, all those other things, like, like Ty is saying, like, that would do, there would be so many brothers beating down the therapist's door, you know, at that point to get the help mm -hmm. that they need you know it would be it would be tremendous it'd be tremendous yeah, yeah. indeed but there was looks like uh who said that there was mention of safe space safe spaces that was sherry um, uniquely needing sherry. to create yeah thank you uniquely sherry creating safe spaces um i think it's the other way around i think we need people who are strong enough to come out and say this is what it is because a safe space means like it needs to be a secret that you're saying it because you're in this environment as opposed to saying hey, I'm, it's out, this is what it is, I need help, there's really nothing wrong with me, but you know, there are things that affect me and having that be normal. Right, and not being frowned upon if someone was to come out with something like that. Mm -hmm. We got about uh, seven minutes or so left with Dr. Lee <laughs> Willis, uh -huh. uh, uh, medical sociologist and all around uh, good man because he's bringing up topics that a generation of folks have wrongly ignored, and that's black male mental health. I know that there's some women on here who say, well, what about the black female? And I actually saw that, uh, and I appreciate that topic, but uh, I feel like one thing that women do more than men is talk a lot a lot women have different coping mechanisms now whether those coping mechanisms are healthy or not you all do have them because you're allowed to have them as a woman as a black man you're supposed to be superman and heathcliff huxtable not bill cosby but heathcliff huxtable <laughs> at the same time all right uh, i do have an update. i do have an update for those who are here to see dante dante literally just text me uh, because of the nature of his job, I got the text right here. So I don't want to hear nobody saying it was false advertising. What's good, Sean? Not going to be able to make it tonight. Still working and busy. Lock in for the night. Apologies for the late notice. So what I mean by that is that Dante's not going to make it unless he shows up late if we run long. This show is scheduled for two hours. We'll have overtime if Ty wants to continue to chat. But we only have like six or seven minutes with Dr. Law. And I'm going to bring on hopefully a, a surprise guest or two so we can keep the conversation going. And you know what? Conversations. I'll stay yeah. on a little bit longer. You'll yeah. stay on a little bit longer. It's needed. We, we, it's needed. Yeah. We got we all do that, man. Let me tell you something. That means we talking some good stuff. Cause Lee's like, look, all right, man. I, I got thirty minutes. I don't know. I, I got, I got, I could watch something else. But he's like, I mean, I'll help you out, man. Like, yeah, yeah, help me out. Help me out, brother. That's what we gotta do. Brothers uh, gotta help brother. Yeah. So. And stretch me out yeah, because uh, our our sponsor Kim Dudley mentioned that her 
uh, the father of her son killed himself, and she's willing to come back and talk about it in the bottom half of the hour. Uh, she's the one that's sponsoring us right now. You see the pin. Uh, very good stuff. Bodybutterbakery.com. Code mental for 50% off up till midnight yeah. on the East Coast tonight. 5-0, 50% up till midnight Eastern time. Yeah. And uh, Kim is going to come back and talk about her situation right around the time when uh, Lee leaves us. I'm going to start calling you Lee now because you, you decided that's to hang out. Uh, but, I totally wanted, can't. <laughs> but I always want to give black people who earned that that degree their respect you're not just some black person talking mess you know what you're talking about you've done the studies you've seen it in action and you can see the progression or digression so with that said i'm going to ask you something Lee. sure what do you think about that halftime show oh the halftime show i have an essay at the end of it i had an essay at the end of this but what do you think about that you know i enjoyed it i wished that it would have been like 10 years ago um because i think with the super bowl they always get they're always late with most things mm -hmm. um and i think that given that you know hip-hop and dre and all of them have been a force um, for so long, like they're kind of getting them at the tail end. I mean, I thought it was cool that they had Kendrick because you know Kendrick is still you know popping, Re um, relevant. Yeah, 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 yeah. And and you know, in many ways, he's taking. I love that Dre included him because he's like taking that baton for the West Coast. Him and his you know TDE folk and all of that. Um, I thought that I thought that it was great. I mean, I enjoyed it. Um, you know, I thought it was phenomenal. I know. There were a lot of haters, people that didn't like it, claimed they weren't going to watch. And that was yeah, fun. they were. Yeah. Is it is it top five show? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I would say so. Yeah, I would give it. Um, yeah, it's definitely top five. Who's your top yeah. show? Do you have a top show? Uh, Prince. He killed it, right? The, yeah, Prince the, totally killed that. And the fact yeah. that it was raining and he did Purple Rain like that. Was, you, you just can't script it better than that, right? And Prince said, like, they, they said, and we're going to get back to the conversation of this one. Prince said, uh, and by the way, all of this will tie in at the end of my essay, so stick around for Sean says. Prince actually said, uh, <laughs> at the press conference before the show when he found out that it was gonna that was raining the forecast. Uh, and he said, Can you make it rain harder? He literally wow. he, that's, wow. he's like, I'm gonna I'm gonna sing live. I'm gonna have Bethune Cookman do their thing, doing Let's Go Crazy and it was brilliant. Um all right, so we're we're here with Dr. Lee Willis. Lee A. Willis, but we're calling him Lee now. And he's gonna stick around until about nine fifteen, nine twenty. Mm -hmm. And uh, then we're gonna uh, transition to our, our next guest after that. But so we're gonna talk about creating these safe spaces. Um there are 70%, 70% of our audience last week was, were women, Ty. So, black women, are they responsible for creating the safe space? I, I know it's at, black women hate to be asked a lot. They want men to be in, in good standing when they meet them. Uh, and they shouldn't be in the position to rehabilitate a man. But is there a way you think that we as a society can talk about how important it is to say, hey, brother, are you okay? Without making it seem like it's a bad thing to have mental issues from black men. What is that? I, I, think start, I think it starts at home. I don't think we can, you know, make women responsible for, you know, our mental well-being. That, that's, a, that's a lot of pressure to put on them to have to think about what this dude is like mentally and I need to cater to that so I think it starts with you it starts at home I think it starts you know amongst ourselves and you know I mentioned that I, I'm not a fond of that safe place talk because it feels like you need to hide it from the world I think your safe space is wherever you are like, I don't really care if people think um, I'm soft or think I'm crazy for talking about it because I feel like that's the approach that everyone should have. Mm -hmm. But everybody at the same time, it, you you are different. Everybody's different. 
And it could be that someone has to be in a safe space till they get to the point where they are comfortable and okay being able to stand out and say, like, this is, you know, what's going on with me and I don't care. So, I mean, I totally respect you for being, you know, able to do that and not being worried and concerned. But I think that there are, um, for whatever reason, there are a lot of other, you know, people who, who don't feel like they can do that, at least not that they can't do it ever, but they just can't do it right away. No, I, I totally understand. I've heard people say that, you know, they worry about how it may affect their job, mm-hmm. you know, how it may affect potential business deals, uh, people's willingness to work with you, um, even relationships. Um, yeah. even child custody, mm-hmm. you know, things like that. Um, so I yeah. totally get it. I understand. Um, which is which is why I'm trying to make it seem like it's not uh, a bad thing. I, don't, I, I, <laughs> I try my best to try to explain it um, in a way that people shouldn't look down on you. People shouldn't try to use your vulnerability Right. Um, as a, right. As a weakness to target you. You know, I'll say it. You know, like, fuck it. I'll say it. You know, black women have. Come on, this, son. Uh, no, I'm going to do this real quick. Black women use <laughs> uh, terms like uh, protect my peace, girl. My mental is. Black women accept everything for black women. There's another side to that coin. And if you can't understand that, men need that too then you're not understanding what the relationship's about. Men are not birth knowing directions to shit and having the answers to shit. We're people just like you. Now, we have to be formed and forged differently to be the man that you want. But we're so screwed up as a society right now. Black men are catching hell from all comers and sides. And so I'm not trying to like just like litigate black women, but I'm saying if black women allow for certain spaces amongst them they need to allow those same things amongst men now i'm not the type of brother to say like look brother you you need to do everything that these women do uh, you know i think that men and women have different different formulas. i, I just yeah. believe that yeah, different friend. ways of being yeah. different ways of being but it does not mean that as human beings we do not need the same things just in different ways and so that's why i say it like that so i don't i don't want to tiptoe around that now you, you may want to step away from that, but remember the views and opinions expressed by this show or Sean Dunn, <laughs> Sean's alone, as long as this is called the show, yeah. show. <laughs> you know. I mean, and- yeah, go ahead, go ahead, guys. No, I was just going to say, like, I know, like, recently, um, like, I lost my father and I lost two of my uncles, you know, that I was close with. God bless and, you, you know, like, yeah, 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 it's all good. Um, and, and I'm married, you know, I have a five-year-old. And my wife, you know, she would just ask me, she'd be like, how are you doing? And, like, we've been married for 11 years. And, like, I could just tell her, I'm not doing good i'm just gonna be honest with you honey i'm just not doing good Mm -hmm. and she was like okay like number one the fact that she asked like that means that she's observed you know that i'm not that i'm off right Mm -hmm. Uh, without me really having to like say much and she did ask me and i told her and she was like you know what you should you should think about going to see your your therapist again you know and she didn't say it in a way that made me feel less than like you need to go talk to your therapist like it, it, it was not it was not like that at all but she was like I think you know perhaps you should consider going back to your therapist and that was like the little push that I needed to like actually go back you know and do that so that's just yeah. that's just you know that's just food for thought. So what I'm trying to say, I guess, is if, if when a when a woman is in tune with her man, like she'll she'll know when you're off. And you know, I'm not gonna say that all black women are gonna attack you. Like some of them, I think they generally want us to be well, just in general. And so they will say, you know, um, you know, they will. Uh, They'll 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 give us the push and the nurturance that that we need in for order in order for us to get well. Excuse me. Yeah. 
Yeah, look, I mean, I, I'm kind of agreeing with you, Sean. I definitely hear you lead. You know, having a woman that allows you, um, you know, that puts herself out there to be your emotional and mental safe space, um, like that really puts you in a place where like you would never want her to go mm -hmm. anywhere. So just, you know, I would say for women to just be a little empathetic. Right. Right. You know, that something may be there. And you, you hit it right on the head, right? Don't be trying to clown me because I'm having a bad day. I'm having a bad week. And you're just going to come at me like, man, up. you know, like I'm going to probably seek, <laughs> you know, my yeah. mental and emotional safe place elsewhere. Yeah. Right? And then you're going to wonder why I'm not talking to you. And it's because I don't feel emotionally safe around you. And, and, and what I will also say, though, now, I'll always there's always a caveat to this. Women, that does not mean you need to engage a man who may not have sorted these things out. I'm not saying you need to fix a man, but if you're with a man in general, everybody's mentals are different and understand and recognize that we may need to sort those things out if we're in a certain space with you, and that's okay. It doesn't mean we're about to turn into Kanye or Antonio Brown or whomever. Okay. All right. Uh, yeah. Doing the radio thing real quick, 916. We got like three or four more minutes with uh, Lee Willis here. Uh, Dante had to cancel because of the nature of his job as Deputy Superintendent of Corrections here in, the D in D.C. He has a lock-in that is actually difficult. We were going to get him on to talk about uh, his observances with the youth and all that stuff and, and, and talk about it on a more uh, uh, not social scientific way, but just actually observances of people that he's dealt with going through that car wash of the correction system. And so we will bring him back on because we're going to talk to him about a number of stuff, including y'all, Ty, hanging out at parties and didn't call me this weekend. How y'all how um, call me? What the hell? What are you talking about? Oh. <laughs> yeah, that's a yeah, that's been a touchy subject. What calling me? Nah, <laughs> just the fact that we was there. Oh yeah, y'all shouldn't have. Oh well, oh that's a different thing. Oh I see. Oh yeah, right. that's a whole nother thing. That's some ready to love drama. Uh, Lee, did you watch Ready to Love? Do, does your wife watch, wife watch Ready to Love? My wife watches it, <laughs> and I, she, she is she is watching y'all season, I believe. Oh, she so she's catching up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What's, what? Oh, great. She ain't got no opinion yet. <laughs> so you so you inbox me when she has an opinion. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll let y'all know. I'll be like, oh, this is what my wife said about y'all. You know. <laughs> yeah. No, but I talk to y'all with good cats, though. Lee, how often do you have these type of conversations with your core group of guys? Um, you know, like. I would say just depending on uh, you mean just like a free flowing conversation about what's yeah. going on with us. What's like, going on, Jay? Yeah. Yeah, like our mental. Um, I would say probably about once a week. Like I have friends that I may talk to every day, uh, mm -hmm. just check in. Um, yeah, yeah, I would definitely say that. And and what they will say, what I will say to them is, I'm like, look, man, I really need to holler at you about something. Yeah. And we're to that point where we know, okay, this is going to be, you know, kind of like a pack your lunch. I need to listen, you know, yeah. be responsive, um, those sorts of things. Um, so, so, yeah, I mean, I'm fortunate. Now, I will say we did not start off that way, though, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and we did have a friend that um, we had a friend that passed away and that actually brought us closer. Um, we said that we would always check in on each other that we would always tell each other that we loved each other which is like a very rare thing seeing black men in their 20s saying man i love you you know what yeah, i'm saying yeah, which yeah. Is very rare um but it was something that we said that we were going to do so i try to do that and encourage that in all my friends so i'm fortunate in that you know usually at least once a week um we, we may not get together as a big group it, it may be like one-on-ones and things like that but yeah we do check in with each other yeah, that's good. Um, we recently just started making that normal, but it was the political climate and it was um, COVID that made us start having these conversations and we realized that they were needed. So we started having them more often. Got 
Got it. Got it. So it's good. But yeah. it, you know, it shouldn't take you know near death experiences <laughs> for the work. It shouldn't take pandemics, right. right, for that to occur. Yeah. Yeah. One thing I would encourage guys to do. I'm gonna challenge both of y'all to do this, right? Okay. I used to do this. Uh, when I lived in Athens, when I lived in Birmingham, and when I lived in Atlanta, I haven't really done it in a long time. But we would get a group of guys together, like about, about maybe 10 of us max, and we would just go to breakfast one Saturday morning. Yeah, and it was no, work. yeah, good, good, yeah. good, good. Because there's no Recall. agenda, there's no nothing. <laughs> you can come and talk about whatever you want. Yeah, and, we have a, yeah. We, we, well, with my, well, my core group here in D.C., and uh, Ty needs to start smoking to do this, but we, we, we have our grievances at the cigar shop. Yeah, we have a, we get a stick, house. we go to the cigar, we get have a, stick, a good smoke. steak. Yeah. You That's know, what's up. And That's we just what's up. chat it up about business, the family, okay. you know, well, all that stuff. And, and, and I tell you what, watching, when y'all, yeah. when, when y'all get ready to come to Atlanta, let me know, and I'll put you on to a couple spots. Okay. We'll just we'll do that. We'll holler. Hey, I think okay. I already did a cigar social club and uh, uh, I did Cam's joint fellowship. Fellowship, okay. Okay. fellowship is nice. The food is great and the scenery okay. is sensational. All right, we're gonna wrap up here. Um, as a guest of the Sean Show, as a featured guest of the Sean Show, and being such a great sport, Dr. Willis will get a signed, autographed, hard copy of Broke. Men trying to get it together, which is on this topic because I wrote this book about four guys of different statuses of life and their narratives of what the, how the story is is told. First person accounts all four of them which tied together, is done as if they were talking to someone on a couch. Okay. You know what I mean? So it's sort of yeah, like, yeah. It's sort of like black men expressing themselves with the freedom to express themselves, uh, the way they express themselves with all the, the craziness that we we do and we get into. And uh, it's, it's broke. It's available on my website at www.jsd.com for you to get a signed copy. Ty has a signed copy. He's still stuck Word. in the first chapter, but that's all cool. <laughs> <laughs> I have one more question, one more follow-up. Yeah, please, please, for, uh, before we let him go. Doctor, doctor, sure, 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 sure. Um, how do I phrase this? Um, you know, you are a successful guy, right? How do you feel your success affects your ability to relate to the youth? Um, when it's time to have conversations like this, yeah, yeah, that's a that that's a really that's a really important question. Um, I mean, I think that in some ways it's about remembering when you were their age. You know what your hopes, what your dreams were, what people share with you, what people um, didn't share with you. Um, it, 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 I, I think that in some ways they may see like you know the kind of car you drive the clothes that you wear and they may think that it's not relatable necessarily um but i think once they begin to actually listen to what it is that you're telling them um that it's okay i mean you know you can make money and still listen to rap music and you know do all oh, yeah. kinds of like fly <laughs> shit i mean because i used to think like when i grow up when i hit 40 i'm gonna be lame automatically right but you know i don't like 47 i know that ain't the case because i don't think i'm lame i may but I don't know. But anyway, um, yeah, I think that that can be kind of a challenge just in general, because I think kids, this gen these, these, these up and coming generations are very different just because the world is very different. Like we didn't have no Instagram. We didn't have no camera phones and like all of that kind of stuff. And people constantly watching. Um, I can still hear you. I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Cool. But I think at the on. end of the day, I, I think people are, are still going to be people. So I think that there is a way to cut through and connect. And I have been able to connect with um, with some young people. And, and I have like younger like nieces and nephews and so I'm able to kind of, they keep me young. That's that's uh, that's encouraging because sometimes we don't know if these kids are listening to us. Uh, you know, we want to be old. We become old men. We're all Generation Xers shaking our fists. In fact, I have my my essay at the end of the show. Sean says is about uh, our relationship as Generation Xers with the young folk. 
Uh, we're going to let that be the last word for you, Lee. It's 924 okay. past the hour. Thank you, Dr. Yeah. Willis. Yeah, uh, thanks, brothers. I we, enjoy coming on. Nice to meet you, man. Please, please yeah, come nice back. Nice as well. We're going we're gonna, to like, keep, keep abreast of this topic, but we're also going to be sunnier as well and talk about the Marvel Universe and if DC is catching up. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> and I want to encourage you guys, um, me and my boys, me and four other brothers, or three other brothers, we have a podcast called Stuff We Like, Stuff We Hate, where all we do is chop it up about Marvel, DC, games, um, mm-hmm. comics, like collectible toys, like all that. Mm-hmm. So so I'll shoot y'all the link to it and y'all can check it out. We're, we're, okay. we're like about like 40 episodes deep in it. And it's That's hilarious. Oh, it just sounds like some cool uh, yeah. 40-year-old geek shit that I love. Yep, and old, old black man. Grouchy old black man who, who, who ain't shaved in a little bit and right, tired, of, right. tired of all this mess. I love it. I love it. Thank you, bro, so much. We all right. With you. And uh, stay stay black. Talk to you all soon. All right. Love y'all, man. Take care. All right. Thank you. Okay. Really great conversation. <laughs> so uh, we are at 25 past the hour. Ty, that was a really good conversation. We do have Kim Dudley, who dropped us a, a, a quite a cliffhanger. She's about to fly in. So she can discuss a little further about what happened with her uh, then love of the life uh, who suffered from mental illness as well, or had a mental issue that he ended up taking his life. Uh, before we bring her on, uh, just to recap, the folks who are looking for Dante from Ready to Love, our castmate, Dante is still held up in a lock-in for DC Corrections because he's superintendent of DC Corrections. He has to handle business. You know, he's got to handle the lock-in. We're going to bring him back as soon as we can. Can. I showed y'all the text. Uh, Dante is not only a man of his word, he is quite a dude. And uh, you talk about a brother who comes from Chicago. He, he has tons of insights about what's going on with our black youth and uh, all that stuff. I feel like we're doing that old uh, public uh, public access shows. You know, what's going on with the black youth? <laughs> but uh, what do you think about that conversation, Todd, before we bring in Kim real quick? I think it was good. Um, it's kind of... I think it's important, you know, moving forward that we try to stay on topic. <laughs> yeah. Um, it can get really deep. I felt like it was getting there. You know what I mean? I wanted, yeah. to, I wanted to keep going. There's so much more to talk about, too. We're definitely going to bring him back. Only, only, he only mm-hmm. promised me, like, 30, 35 minutes, mm-hmm. and we actually stretched 45 minutes with him. But, yes, we're definitely going to bring him back because we were just mm-hmm. scratching the surface on all this. And also, this is a good time, real quick, before we bring in Kim, for you to plug your show that you have on your mental health journey Yeah, that's mm-hmm. coming up on Sunday before we bring in Kim. Yes, we have um, another episode of The Mental Health Journey. This time it's with Kimberly Franco. Um, she lost her brother to suicide. Um, she started an organization called One Common Bond, the number one common bond. Um, she's military as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and part of her military job is to, um, she's a civilian now, is to run suicide prevention for all of the army. So not only do you get to hear her story of um, suicide and how she's handling that, but also from the other end where she has to be the strong one and write letters and create cards and send care packages and how that could affect you if you're spending years and years and years you know sending four five six care packages a week because it's suicide not um not war right not the military not being deployed suicide and if you feel like it's something that you could prevent and there's a lot that goes uh, with that when that doesn't happen. So we get to hear our story, not to say too much, but yes. Uh, on a terrible segue, we bring mm-hmm. in, it's, it's a, but it's a fitting segue, we bring back our sponsor from Body Body Butter Bakery, Kim, mm-hmm. who uh, is so, we're so blessed to have her share her personal story. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm going to just share with you what she, she said to me when I told her that Dante couldn't show up. Uh, she said she was willing to talk about it, but she didn't want to talk about it in front of her daughter because this is the man that... Correct. This is the father of your daughter. Correct, Kim? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, but we're, we're so grateful for you to come back. We're in that lovely blue, by the way. And 
that that skin is effervescent. She is our sponsor, Body Butter Bakery. Uh, this is a crude sponsorship uh, because of the topic, but uh, she's willing to share with us her her mental health uh, journey with her ex man. And uh, there's a there's a discount available as you see in the pen quote fifty percent if you type in mental and purchase something by midnight Eastern time tonight. Kim, welcome back. Uh, can you please share with us what you what you started to share with us earlier? Yeah, so um, I was in a relationship for maybe just a year. Um, it went very fast. We, he moved in probably, we, we lived in different states. We traveled back and forth. Um, and he moved in maybe six months after we started dating. We had my daughter uh, when she was one. Um, he decided that it would be a great idea to set the house on fire and hang himself. So I lost everything, including him. Every like every everything we owned. And I actually that was in twenty ten and I haven't been back to that house since. Like I went and visited the house. Was that the house you posted last week? That was the house. That was the house. It, it was actually my parents owned the house, so it was my um, childhood house. So it instantly went from being my childhood house to the house my ex passed in. It's no longer Jesus. my childhood house to me. It's it's it was, so, it was it's crazy. So this went from I'm gonna just try to encapsulate this a place where you have family memories. Yes. To a house of horrors. Yes. Now, were you and your daughter in the house when he decided to do this? No, she was with my parents um, because they're both they were both retired. They were daycare. She was with my parents, and I was at work. And the cops came to my job, told me what happened, and that was that. That was I. I, I was numb. I stayed in a room for maybe a year and a half. I didn't talk to anybody. It was a tough time. Thank you for sharing that. And if in, um, if you if you if you want to go, like we're not going to keep you long. But uh, Ty, do you have any questions for Kim when it comes to negotiating someone? No. Has no. This um, if anything, I would say you know I commend you for being public and being strong enough to talk about it. Um, you know, I I pray that you continue to have that strength. You know, to be able to, you know, let that come out of your mouth. Um, the closure, uh, I don't even know if I can speak to having closure, but I hope I don't you look can get to closure. a place. I, I don't expect to get any. Um, mm -hmm. It's just something you learn to navigate around when you don't really heal from it. I understand. But, you know, I pray for the strength you, for you to have, you know, continually throughout your life and, you know, for your little one as well. Has it been a keep on moving type of thing for you, Ken? Just, yeah. just keep moving so one foot in front of the other? The way I operate is I just I stay busy to not think about it. And this is year 12. Correct? Yeah. But when you live with somebody that looks like them, a daily reminder. Uh, you said you had, your daughter does not know. No. I told her about the house fire. I, I'll probably tell her that so he actually hung himself when she's maybe 18, maybe 21, as long as I can hold it. Because I don't want her to ever feel any kind of responsibility for it. You know, like... Why didn't he do it before I got here? Why did he wait? Am I the reason? I don't. I don't want to introduce any crazy thoughts. So, I'm, I hopefully no family member will tell her before I get to. But no, she doesn't know. I don't think she can handle it right now. Wow. Um, did you see any type of signs of this? Looking back, have you rewound it to see if you could see some signs of of this man doing this? I should have, I think, um, like explosive responses to small situations, maybe. Volatility. Um, yes. Ir irritable and volatile. Yeah. Oh. Yep. Unjustifiably so. And his uh, mother is actually still on the street. Um, so is it is, is it hereditary? I don't know, but she 
battles. She's bipolar. His mother is. So was he? I don't know if he was. He wasn't treated for it or he didn't tell me it, about it. Um, I, I, I feel like I, I may have missed signs, but like I said, we, we were together. Everything happened so fast, and we were living in different states until he moved in. So I, I probably wasn't exposed to signs. How old was he? Born in 75. Jesus, he's a year. He was probably my age. He would have been my age. I'm 45. I'll be 46, and I'm born in 76. So he, he's our contemporary, Ty, because uh, Lee was born in the year I think that he would be. So mm -hmm. the men you're talking to right now would be around the age of what he is now. You're younger than that, by the way. Let's let everybody know. Just, just, <laughs> like, she, she's younger than that, and she's all beautiful. And you see the skin because... Body Butter Bakery, and it's 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 it's, it's, a, it's yeah. Talk to you, I'm gonna refill, but uh, we're so blessed to have Kim not only sponsor us, um, but because we like to have conversations on good stuff. But she's also shared something very personal, and I hope you all are very respectful of that. But if you if you go on to Body Butter Bakery tonight by midnight, she's blessed us with the code fifty percent off, uh, and the apple uh, body butter is about to be retired for the season. Yep. She has three three units of that left. Uh, CPI Be Real uh, says, thank you, Kim, for sharing. Uh, and your, your prayers are with you and your daughter's continued strength and blessings. And she also said that she just bought some of the stuff in an thank earlier you, thank post. Thank you, thank um, you. Yeah, and, and, and Kim's story, guys, is that uh, this is a working woman. She was a cosmetologist for several years. I come from a hair family. You don't see it, but I come from a hair family. Obviously. Um, obviously, my mom, uh, cosmetologist, my late father, master barber. Uh, and I could go into that for other stories. So I know how tough that work is. A working woman down there in Florida. And she started making body butter. Ooh. Out of curiosity? What, what was it? It was um, pandemic work. What was it again? I, I was... I, I was selling a private label company's body butter in 2017 and I just started making my own recently um, to stop buying theirs and it blew up so now that's what I do full time and she's been doing it full time since October oh, she is, absolutely she is hiring because she needs some, some more hands on deck because she is a one woman machine but she cranks the joints out uh, you have not received a copy of my book that I sent out because I'm sending it very cheap mail I already sent it cheap mail uh, her stuff came out within 48 hours when she said she sent it out to me so Kim is on the money and I know we just had Valentine's Day but y'all could have found out last week I should have told you she also has edible Body butter bakery. I didn't mention. Yeah, yeah. You sure didn't. You, you I, I forgot about it. Yeah. You know, a lot of women like 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 uh, the edible. Actually. Yeah, and it, yeah. It, that's popping too. But you can buy that year round. You know, Valentine's Day is every day if you in a real relationship. If you ask me, but anytime you can buy the Bay Butter B A E Bay Butter <laughs> it's the edible with body butter. <laughs> The Bay Butter is available. Yeah. So go to the website, uh, check out all her stuff. Once again, she's our she's our lead sponsor of the show, Body Butter Bakery. It is tagged, is pinned on the uh, on the site. Code Mental fifty percent until noon uh, midnight tonight Eastern Time. We're thirty eight past the hour. Kim, thank you so much. Is there anything else you would like to share with us before I let you go? And Ty, is there anything you'd like to ask Kim? <clears throat> I'm good. Yeah, I'm, 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 I didn't want to put a damper on your night. I ended up crying. Yeah, I'm sorry. No, no, don't worry. Yeah. We're real ignorant real soon. Okay. So, you, you know, all right, so I'm going to keep you on here, see what you think about this. And, Ty, this relates to you, too. You know, we'll have our little banter before we close out the show a little bit. Uh, does edible come with a code for man? No, why divine 21? <laughs> edible does not, but... Oh, someone just bought the bay butter. Miss Don't Believe the Hype, come back and tell us how it tastes. Giggity. Uh, so, <laughs> I have uh, my announcement. I, I also promoted an announcement for the show. If you're living in the DMV area, ladies and gentlemen... The Soul Date, my dating service for black and brown people, is back. And uh, we have a date and we have a location. March 19th, if you're in the Washington, D.C. area, we will be at, drum roll, Kitchen Cray 
Crate, Virginia, March 19th. Mark it on your calendar. Kitchen Crate, Virginia, in Alexandria, Virginia, March 19th. We will give you the time. But I'll tell you this, they're already hooking us up with a special happy hour for our daters. And uh, Ty, you got a date? I got to be there. Ty said he going to be there. Hey, Ty, you going to be there. We all dated out by now. Let me tell you something, uh, Kim. <laughs> that dating was not dating. That was some other stuff. That that, some of that was some other stuff. So okay. Yeah. Our ready to love dating experience is way different from the speed dating difference. I, I will be the host. Um, we will have live. We we'll have some great music. We have a live DJ there. We'll have happy hour specials. So stay tuned. More information will come on Sean's show and at J Sean Durham Inc. Kim, thank you so much. Uh, baby, God bless you. Uh, how old is your baby, by the way? How She's 12. 12. Yeah. Such a fresh, 